Are you guys ready to learn how to make video games? Yes. Good. Uh, <laughs> well, you will be able to. I promise you that. Um, this is the third time I've done this at MAGFest. I believe this talk has also been sort of performed a few other times. Um, once by Ruthie Edwards over here. Give it up. I tend to make these slides sort of open source-ish. So you can do what Ruthie did and if you enjoyed it, you can get rid of all my trash slides and make them better <laughs> and do a better job. Uh, so let's, yes? Will there be a URL when you get the slides? There will be on my Twitter feed. Oh. Trick to you, now you have to follow me. <laughs> and that'll be up later too. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, who's this talk for? Uh, this talk's going to teach you a lot about making games, a lot about different things that go into making games, um, like art and music and sound design and programming and even just game design in general. Um, so you're going to learn all that, but this talk is specifically for a narrow group of people, uh, and that is the person that has always wanted to make video games. Maybe they grew up playing video games. Maybe they found out about video games like last week and decided to come to MAGFest. Uh, but they've always felt like uh, they're not capable of making video games uh, in any aspect, whether it's that they think that programming is too difficult. Who, thinks, who here thinks that programming is too difficult? All right, so, I mean, y'all can just ignore most of this talk. Um, or whether it's somebody that's like, you know, I really wish I was better at art. If I was better at art, maybe I could make a video game. Or, yeah, was, that's weird. See, because I always was, I grew up drawing and doodling, and I always thought if I could program, I could make video games. And I just, because human beings are weird and dumb and we have brains that work certain ways, I just assume everybody has my experience. Um, but they don't. And this talk is for people that want to make video games now and they can't and they think it's all because of them, but I'll tell you it ain't. The first thing you need to know is to understand who can help you. And that's pretty easy to understand. Uh, who here has made a game? Go ahead and raise your hand and keep it raised. Okay, so everybody in the room that wants to make a video game and doesn't think they can, just remember all these people because all these people have something that they can tell you that will help you out. Okay, you can put your hands down. Um, and one of those peoples is me. I'm Will Blanton. Um, I've been a game developer for several years. I've developed a bunch of games. Uh, I guarantee you've never heard of any of them, so don't let those numbers think, make you think that like, oh, we got a big shot up there. Uh, no, uh, but they have earned multiple awards because they're super good. Uh, and I've shown them at multiple events, abroad, here, MAGFest, uh, speaking of which, um, MIVS, MAGFest Indie Games Video Game Showcase is just downstairs over by the arcade. So you should check those people out because they all have good information in making games because they've made some. Um, and I'm a game developer who works at a company in Richmond, Virginia called Mobilux. And we make uh, apps and websites, crazy weird things, hardware. Um, we just like making cool stuff. Uh, and one of the cool stuff that they like to make is games, and that's me. Um, that's my Twitter handle. I think it's probably my Instagram handle, too. I don't know. Uh, so this talk is going to go through a lot of stuff, and it will present it in a way that should be palatable to someone who doesn't understand um, things. But I will say that if you don't understand it when I'm talking to you, that's my fault, that's not your fault. Um, there's plenty of resources online, so if you caught, if you caught somewhere like, ah, oh, this doesn't make any sense, I don't get it. 
just um, if you're interested in it, just look it up and somebody on the internet will do a better job than I am right now. Um, also, it's not meant to diminish the collective human um, work that has gone into uh, like music or art. Uh, I'm gonna basically show you how to make a stick figure and I'm gonna say now you can make art and that, I don't mean that to diminish artists that have spent their uh, like 50 years on this earth trying to perfect their art, and now they're like, well, this guy's bullshit. So now that we have that out of the way, uh, think about the kind of game you want to make, like just in your head. And um, you know, for me, a long time ago, I kind of had all these sort of visions of games that have like sprawling sort of 3D worlds and all these NPCs and all these side quests and like really cool music and uh, in my head it sort of, it, it was this thing that could unroll over time, you know, like and, and like most projects, like you're, you gotta, you gotta, you buy a house, you gotta do house stuff. So you're like, I'm gonna get a deck. And like that's something that you just plan for over time and you like find somebody that can do this and find somebody that can do that. And eventually your dream becomes reality. And games are a lot like that, but I wanna talk about the, a game that you can make tomorrow. Um, and that's like really, for me personally, when uh, all these anxieties come up. Because like when I'm thinking about like this like fantasy game that I wanna make, there's like this cool like electronic soundtrack which maybe I could make, but you know, it'd be really cool to get so-and-so to like help out on that. And like, you know, it, it has like art that's probably a little bit beyond me. Maybe I could get better at it, but you know, maybe it'd be better to just find somebody else to do it and stuff like that. And so when you're faced with making a game tomorrow, um, you ha get all this anxiety about all these things that you can't do, right? Like, oh man, like I don't, I don't think I can code a game tomorrow, so I'm just not, you know. I'm just not gonna do that as a tomorrow activity. It's gonna be this long, sprawled out thing. Um, but this talk is about kind of game development as a hobby, as something that you can do to like fulfill your life, enrich it, and do any day of the week. You got 10 minutes, you can start making a video game. You got a couple of days, you can make a couple of video games, you know? So you have all these anxieties, but what I really want you to focus on is your own skill set, because that's what's important. That's what you're bringing to video games, you know? <clears throat> and that could be a number of things, you know? Um, it could be, I really like animals. Uh, so why don't I just make a game about animals with all these facts I know about animals? Um, and that kind of thing is really important because diverse people make diverse games. And like that's kind of what games are really uh, great about. Um, not only because diverse people play diverse games and you know it's great that you might want to make like a, a game that you know simulates uh, hair loss or like um, <laughs> or, or like uh, shows you how bathrooms and airplanes are made. Somebody's gonna wanna play those games. But more importantly, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna make that game. Like if that's what you're really into, like it's, it's game dev is just another uh, medium. It's an artistic medium. And you are here on this earth for a finite amount of time and you deserve to express yourself in meaningful ways. And if one of those ways is a video game, then go for it. So a big important part about knowing your skill set is knowing you know, things you're not very good at. Like uh, maybe you're not very good at programming or you're not very good at math. Um, you can still make games around those constraints and Usually I talk about constraints in game development in ways like make a Game Boy looking game that's only four colors. Like that's a good restraint. But like restraints can be anywhere and made out of everything. Time can be a restraint. Only you making the game could be a restraint. Uh, only other people making the game, that would be a fun constraint. <laughs> 
could I trick all of you into making a game right now? No, I'm not going to do that. So really, you, you need to embrace like who you are, what you aren't, and understand that it's fun to make things with constraints. So the rest of this talk, I'm going to go over four different things that are very important to making games. Um, art, audio, code, design, not in that order because I can't read. Um, I'll say up front, there's a lot of audio in this because I feel like um, that's one thing that a lot of game developers kind of sleep on, especially early on in their hobby. Um, but it's also like one of the best ways to add some flavor to a game. And also, audio is one of those things, music, sound, that's something that's like inherent to people. Um, you know, everybody's like, we've been making art since caves and stuff were invented. But we've been making goofy noises way longer than that. So audio is really important. So I'm going to go ahead and explain audio entirely. First, we're going to talk about music and time. So you see up here it says 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 in. If you read that like a robot like I just did, then you just figured out what a bar is. And a bar in music is just some time. Uh, we do this 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 to keep track of that time, to know when to put stuff in a song. Like uh, if we did a song that was like do, 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 then we know that it's like do, 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 do. And then, so if you sort of slow that down, then your brain can figure out exactly where all those notes go. And that's really important. Um, that's one of those things where if you sit somebody in front of a computer with some software to make music and you're like, make some music, they're like, I don't know where to put notes. But now you know. So that's really cool. Um, I only go through 4-4 four, four music. That's a time signature. Because that's probably the most popular uh, time signature. And you also have four fingers on each hand, so it makes it really easy to keep track of. You can just tap your fingers. Um, I sang in the church choir as a young teen. And uh, you could find me uh, in church with a funny robe, uh, just always like, uh, 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 with my, you can't see them, I'm going to do them up here. Because uh, 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 it helped me keep track of time. Um, so yeah, that's a bar. Th this right here is going to represent a note, and it's going to go one and two and three and four. And it's going to last that whole thing. That's why they call that note a whole note. See, people pay conservatories thousands and thousands of dollars for this, but I'm decoding it right now. Can anybody tell me how long that note is? Yeah. You got it. So you've already cracked the code. Uh, they got quarter notes. They got eighth notes. They got sixteenth notes. They got thirty-second notes. They got sixty-fourth notes. They got all the notes you can think of. But now you know exactly what a note is, how long it is, and it's all according to that bar. Uh, space in music. This is an octave. Does he, does anybody? Uh, Recognize what these guys are? It's like a piano. Uh, and if you go to a piano and you see these things, and you see that uh, here's two goofy boys and then three goofy boys, then you know that this is an octave. And these guys down here, that's an octave. And this up here is an octave. And for some goofy reason, we all decided the first letter should be C. Uh, <laughs> And it's, but if you get your head around this weird alphabet and you've cracked another code, it goes C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Uh, these guys up here, these are called sharps or flats. And it's sharp if you're going from here. You call it a C sharp. If you want to be a rebel, you go from the D, call it a D flat. Uh, so who can tell me what this note is that doesn't know anything about music? Nailed it. <laughs> so that should teach you a lot about what you need to know about music, but let's go further. If you play notes sequentially, like if I went up to a keyboard and I was like, dang, 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 then you've made a melody. <laughs> uh, 
example. Oh, you can't hear it. Can you hear it? Listen to that smooth melody. Does anybody know where that's from? Duh. Oh, gracias. Thank you. Um, if you play notes simultaneously, all together, then you make a chord. You just smash your head on a keyboard and it makes a chord. For example, ooh, that's pretty smooth. Uh, major chords are very easy to do. You start at a root note. We're going to start at C, and then we count up four, one, two, three, four, and then we count up seven from the root. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I always skip and just do one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, because life hack. Uh, those guys sound really happy. Ooh. And so that's like triumphant, kind of. Minor chords are like almost exactly the same, but instead of counting up four, you count up three. One, two, three. Um, so they both have the seven. So really, all you need to remember is three, four, and seven. Those are numbers that are, you need to remember. And so uh, if you need to write them down, you can write them down. But honestly, three, four, seven. Ooh, it sounds kind of sad. But wait, let's go back to the major to hear some difference. Ah, oh. ooh, ah, you get it. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is what Fruity Loops looks like or FL Studio, as you kids call it these days. Um, and th this is just a bunch of chords. Um, you can see they're being played simultaneously. And if you play a bunch of them sequentially, as if you were creating a melody, you create a chord progression. You hear that? Oh, it's like the beat's about to drop. It, it doesn't, it doesn't though. Ooh, added a little twist at the end. It's not really simultaneous, but guess what? It sounds cool. So what's cool, now that you know how to make melodies and chords and chord progressions, you can throw them all together to make a song. So uh, full disclosure, I grabbed that melody from a MIDI file because I'm a cheater. But I wrote these chords myself. So you'll know because it'll sound wrong. See how the chords give that melody like some oomph, some life? It fills it up. You ready for the... Mm. <laughs> That's how pianists end songs, by the way. So, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the rest of this talk talking about what you should use to make stuff, because I think that's horse shit. Um, you should use whatever you want. But because, like I said, audio is something that not a lot of uh, game developers or game designers focus on a lot, I figured I'd give you some good recommendations. Um, feel free to ignore this part and just do your own searching and find what you love. But um, this is a tool that's really beginner friendly. It's called Bosca Something, and it's by Terry Cavanaugh of VVVVVV fame and um, most recently, Dicey Dungeons. And he just made this cool thing and put it out there. And it's pretty easy to use. See how it looks sort of like the uh, Fruity Loops thing? You can put a D in. You can put a C in. You can put any note in. Something that uh, has a lot more depth. So if this is something you really enjoy, you can dig in deeper. Um, you could use FL Studio, Fruity Loops. This is my main man. I've been using this for like. 20 years, I'm old. Um, but this also has like a really easy interface. See those notes up there? That just means doot, 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 doot. You can just start there. You can ignore most of this stuff. And then you can just explore it at your own pace. Um, if you wanted to make some authentic chip tune for your real 8-bit goodness, you could use something like Fami Tracker. 
This is a tracker, so it looks all crazy. There's like rows that looks like spreadsheets, and so people think it's like terrifying and really weird. But um, I'm not going to go into how to do it, but I'll tell you that if you look up some videos on how to do it, it's something that kind of comes natural after a few, a few days of working with it. Um, and there's music's cool because there's a million different things out there to use. This is a combination of all those things. It's called Renoise by a Renoise team. It's really a bunch of people with weird names that I didn't feel like writing out. But um, that has a tracker interface. It looks like a spreadsheet up here, but you can do all kinds of fancy stuff like you can do with any other good digital audio workstation. So let's talk about sound. Now that you know how to make any kind of music you want to make ever, now we'll talk about sound. This here is a sine wave. And by the way, this is a really important thing that you'll be using in game development all the time, because sine waves are really cool. Uh, but you see it just goes up and down. That's basically all the sine wave is. Um, it travels through time. See how it's traveling? And then it also has amplitude. And amplitude is like volume, but it's if you want to sound like a scientist when you're talking to fancy people. Um, but you see how far it is from that middle line? That determines how loud it is. Uh, apologies at a time. Fewer cycles over time mean it gives a lower frequency. See, it sound, it sounds kind of bassy, not super bassy, but kind of bassy. Higher frequency mean it goes faster, gives a uh, higher pitch tone. So, in addition to sine waves, you can use all kinds of different waves to make your sound different. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but Here's a bunch of them. Um, you can kind of tell like the difference between this guy and this guy is this guy is like go 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 go. It's like real intense, um, and that means that sound's going to sound more intense. It sounds kind of more harsh than a smooth sine wave. And noise, that's just like white noise. Tell you guys remember TV? It was before the internet. Um, now I'm going to talk about how time can apply to sound in an interesting way. Um, one thing that you'll be doing a lot if you're making sounds for games is messing with different ways to uh, modulate that sound. And one of my favorite ways is an envelope. An envelope goes through time and changes a value from one thing to another. And you can make it go back. Envelopes can be super complex. It could go like but the most basic envelopes say, this is the attack time, and this is the decay time. The amount of time it takes to get to the value that you want, and the amount of time it goes back. So that's a very basic envelope. And you can apply envelopes to all kinds of things. You can apply it to um, like what speaker it's coming from, or like what waveform to use from a group of waveforms, but I'm going to do it with uh, pitch. So you hear that sound, how it, the pitch goes like from to woo, and it does it really quick. So this envelope has a short attack, I mean a short decay and basically no attack. Um, so you could use that to make laser guns and stuff. Um, Here's one with a long attack and a very short no decay. So this is, you could use this to make like a jumping noise or like a bubble. I can't do it. Um, here I'm doing it to the amplitude, the volume of noise. Um, so you could use this as like um, something getting hit or something landing on the ground, or you could use it as percussion in music. Um, so it's really cool because you can, st like, these examples sound like crap because I'm just using it on the most basic sounds, a sine wave and then noise. Um, but if you heard that in a game, you wouldn't care. You'd think it sounded awesome. So some more uh, recommendations for software to use. Um, this is called Chip Tone. It's really similar to another thing called BFXR, which is what I recommended in previous uh, 
versions of this talk. But this maybe looks a little cooler. And you see how you've got your waveforms up here. You got those harsh ones. You got that smooth sign. And then look, you have uh, two different envelopes for the frequency, the pitch, how uh, low or high it sounds, and the amplitude or volume. So with this, without even going into all these other things that you can use, you can make some really cool sounds. This is also easy for beginners because if you wanted a jump sound, I don't think you can read that, but you can just press the jump button and it sort of makes one for you. Um, but I do recommend that you tweak the values from there so that you kind of get a handle on it. And when you need something maybe more expressive that isn't on that list, then you can like come up with ideas on your own. You can also get crazy with sound design and get something with a lot more depth and you could spend a lot more time with it. This is called Massive X. It's by a company called Native Instruments. Um, but you can see it's pretty similar. You got your waveforms up here and then you've got some envelopes down here. You've got an amp envelope, that means for amplitude. And then you have a modulation envelope that you could apply to anything like the pitch or frequency. So those are a couple things. Um, with music, uh, some of the best advice I can give you is to just experiment all the time. Um, humans are very innate to make sound and make music. But these tools sort of take that like very like uh, human thing and put it into this like weird digital realm with all these fancy sciencey names that maybe you're not really familiar with. So instead of just like worrying about like, oh lordy, I need to go get a math degree to figure out what frequency modulation is, just fiddle some knobs, have fun. Um, those knobs will tell you what it's doing to the sound by you hearing it, and then you can intuitively work from there. Art. So more, more of you than I thought um, said that they, couldn't, they felt like uncomfortable doing art. Um, and art is kind of like the next step in human evolution, right? First we made dubstep, and then we figured out how to write on caves. So art was sort of like what happened next. Um, I'm going to tell you how to draw a face, and I'm going to tell you that I drew this face in Google Slides in under a minute. First, you got to do the head. This is a wide boy. <laughs> and most faces have a couple eyes. Um, not all faces. In fact, most middle schoolers that draw anime will tell you that one of the coolest things you can do to make something, give it an eye patch. <laughs> then, again, a lot of faces have a mouth. That's pretty easy. I used like a half circle, because he's smiling. And then also noses. Most faces have a nose. Uh, when you kind of uh, squint hard enough, sometimes noses are triangles. So I just went with a triangle. And then, for the pied de resistance. I did some cool hair. There's a cloud shape in uh, Google Slides. Um, and the, the drawn out point that I'm trying to make here is that, I don't know, maybe you think it looks dumb, but I think that looks pretty cute. Um, and I didn't spend any time and I didn't spend a lot of effort into thinking like, boy, I wish I got these proportions right or maybe uh, this should look more like a human and less like, uh, an indie game. <laughs> so understandably, you're probably sitting there like, okay, you're an idiot. I want to know how to draw like a protagonist in my video game that like I want to sell millions of copies for and that's way tougher, I know, because I've never done it before. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do that. Oh, there we go. There's a protagonist uh, because uh, guess what? This game sold like millions of copies. <laughs> I looked it up on Wikipedia, so millions. And it's just a rectangle. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you're worried that you can't make the art you want to make, that's okay. Like, I'm going to tell you right now that no artist, 
really makes the art they want to make, they make the art that they can make, and then they see people on Twitter that make art maybe a little bit better than them in, that, in their opinion, and they think that they're trash. Um, so if you think that you're trash at art, know that uh, most artists will agree, uh, but with themselves, <laughs> not you. They don't, most people won't say your art is trash unless they're really mean. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about making simple art look good. Because you still want your game to look good. I mean, even if you're really crappy at art, even if you can only do stick figures, you're still going to want your game to look good. But I'm going to make it, I'm going to make you think about how to make it look good with some purpose. And so there's this thing in like the cool indie game like circles that I run in uh, called Juice. Um, it's surprise, it's way different in the world of babies. I'm just figuring that out. But juice can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. This isn't my personal definition. My personal definition is very nuanced and nobody agrees with it. But this is a really good definition. When you're playing a game, you give it input, press right. And then the game processes that and does stuff and then it gives you feedback. And the feedback is where all the juice lies. It's when you press the jump button and Mario jumps. That's feedback. But juice is making that feedback kind of squishy and make it feel a little bit more uh, alive than just some kind of computer program. So here's an example. Um, last year I had some gifts of just uh, some, something I made in Photoshop. This year I actually programmed this myself, no big deal. Uh, and you can see it's really boring. It's a ball bouncing up and down. Um, you can see that it's a ball, I guess. And you can see that it's bouncing, but you, there's no feedback to tell you, like, what's up with this ball? So I'm going to add some squash and stretch, which is like an animation trick that Disney invented and then sold for a million dollars. And that's just making the shape a little bit different. You see how it's like, it squishes down, and then it squashes when it's going quicker. That gives that ball some elasticity. You can tell that the ball is sort of uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Squishy, squashy, squunchy. Um, but w what's important is that now I'm communicating stuff about that ball to you through this art. And I didn't even really do anything that crazy to the art. In, a, in the game engine I use, uh, you can determine an object's scale, which is how much bigger or smaller than it originally is. And I'm just modifying that scale depending on how fast it's moving and if it's hit the floor. Because those are the two things that I want to communicate. I want to communicate how fast is this ball moving, and I want to communicate that hitting the floor matters. Um, another thing you can do that's really fun, you can add camera effects like flashes or screen shake. You can make the camera like, um, a really cool example of this is in a lot of like games, um, if you're in a car and you're going really fast, the field of view sort of uh, tightens up. So like you kind of get this tunnel vision effect and it makes you feel like you're going really fast. It's a really fun way to communicate that you're moving fast without saying like, your miles per hour went up. And then finally, I add some particles. And the particles just sort of sell that like, along with that camera flash and camera shake, that this ball means something. This is a, this is a ball not to be reckoned with. Um, this is a serious ball. <laughs> so with just dumb things like that, you can communicate things in your game um, you know, if somebody punches somebody in your game and like nothing happens, the player feels like that punch sucks. But if you make something explode and you flash the camera and you make your like player's fist gigantic, then people are like, damn, I'm a good puncher. So here's some good examples. Once again, we have Thomas Was Alone by Mike Biffle, the rectangle game. Um, you see all that good squash and stretch stuff that's happening? That just makes those rectangles live. 
Um, another thing he does is like really good writing, so that's another way to bring your game to life. Um, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about juice. This is a game I made um, in 48 hours. It might have been 72. I don't know. I'm bad at that, memorying, memorying things. But you see, uh, I have got a lot of stuff going on here. Out of all the crazy stuff going on here, probably my favorite thing are these lines on the water that sort of uh, reflect the sun and show you how fast you're going. You're going super fast in this game. And that's really all I wanted to do with this game is show people that they're going super fast. And I wanted to add all these different effects to bolster that feeling of going fast. Even though uh, in reality, you're going extremely slow and in most cases not moving at all. It, I'm tricking you, so. Uh, but those rectangles are just white rectangles that I move and then make disappear. Um, so that's like a super simple effect that communicates something, I think, really well. Uh, this game is so good. This is one of my favorite games of all time. It's called Downwell. It's a game about going down a well. And you can see when he lands on things, like enemies in the ground, you see this like big, wow! It's like just, again, a rectangle, just moving up and getting thinner. And it shows you, it's trying to communicate that your guns have been reloaded and you can shoot more things. Um, so it's really cool to use these things in games because a lot of times you're sort of, you want to like, maybe I'll just throw in some text at the bottom that's like, reloaded! Or like, maybe I want to run, put miles per hour up here, a little thing that goes like that. Or maybe uh, I just want to ensure that the player knows that they're squishy by, I don't know, telling them a story about squishiness. But it's, in my opinion, often better to do that with juice. Take, it gets people into the game. It doesn't take them out of it. So when in doubt about making art, Keep it simple, super simple. <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with making games or making art of any kind uh, with a, a minimalist outlook. Um, in fact, a lot of people really enjoy that aesthetic. Um, so even if you don't enjoy that aesthetic, just go with what you know how to do and you, know, you can always juice it up you can dress it up in different ways to make it look a little bit better. You can dress it up in ways like maybe the story is about uh, like particles, so I don't have to draw faces all the time. Uh, moving on to code. Code is one of those things. So I grew up, um, I was born in 1984, um, and when I was like three, I played Mario and I was just like, oh, this is the meaning of life. <laughs> um, and pretty much since then, I've really wanted to make video games. And then up until I was 25 or so, I was just like, oh, well, I guess that'd be cool, but I'm too dumb, so, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Which is really a cool outlook to have on life, to be like, oh, this thing that I dream about making all the time and would, you know, fulfill all of my desires of childhood. Uh, oh well. <laughs> um, and a lot of that, the reason is because like I would look up programming and it just looks up, it looks like gibberish. This looks like gibberish. Who can tell me what that does? It, it prints out hello world, I think, according to whoever I stole this snippet from. <laughs> I don't know, I would never do this. But the point I'm making is that uh, this is bad code. When, when you see code and you read it and you put time into it and you're just like, I don't get it. That just means it's bad code. And a lot of the best programmers in the universe write really bad code because they think they're so smart. Uh, I'm gonna make the case that Good code, you can just read from top to bottom and just understand it. So I'm just going to read this. Var walk speed equals 100. Var jump power equals negative 300. Function movement. This is, says walk. Velocity x equals 0. If keys pressed left, velocity x uh, 
minus equals walk speed. If key is pressed right, velocity x plus equals walk speed. This says jump. If key is pressed space and grounded, velocity y equals jump power. Can anybody tell me what the character would do if I press the space bar? Nailed it. So this is, this is better code. And the reason I like this code is because it reads more like pseudocode. And pseudocode is really important because when you're just chilling at Denny's with nothing to do, you can take out your phone and write pseudocode and then write it out in real code later. So this just says, if the user presses left, make their character move left. If the user presses right, make their character move right. If the user presses the space bar, make the character jump. That's pretty simple. And then we, I go back and I write it out so that it reads like that. Um, part of the fun of coding is sometimes you run into situations where you're like, I don't know how to write this out so that it makes any sense, and you end up with like gibberish. But um, one of the most fun things about programming to me is figuring out ways to make things uh, simple enough so that when I go back in two years because I'm lazy and I can't finish a game uh, quickly, I know what I did two years ago because it makes sense. Um, and you know, there's a lot about video games. There's a ton of stuff that you could program in video games. I'm going to go over a couple of different things that most games do. Not all games do this because games are a vast thing and some video games don't even use code or do anything at all that could just be like a funny TV show or something that has some kind of game element to it, you know? Um, but in general, we've got a couple of things that happen. We have uh, a create function, that's when a game starts, and then we have a update function, and that's when a game loops over, over and over and over. Um, every time the game looks different, it's been updated. So the game updates all the time. In a create function, you just do stuff like initialize the game, maybe I want to set a high score to zero or something. Uh, you load level data, for instance, like maybe you're making a, a platformer like Mario, you're going to load all the blocks in. Maybe you're making a game like um, Minecraft or something, and you generate the level from using crazy math and stuff. Uh, that's when you would do that. And then you just create, plop down all the stuff in the game. That's when all that stuff just gets plopped on down. Uh, in the update function, you do all kinds of things. You can make things collide. So like if I was a video game, I'm colliding with the floor right now. If I was a video game, I'm coll colliding with this table right now. Uh, it's cool to collide with things. It's basically all things do. Um, you can update their velocities. So, uh, you know, if I'm a video game, I'm going to update my velocity so that I can be over here. And now I'm over here. Uh, position each object according to its velocity. So right now I have a position. You apply velocity to me, movement, and then I, my position changes. Um, if you don't code that in, it won't happen. That's kind of cool. You can run enemy AI, NPC AI. So if somebody's meant to hand over the goblet of strengthening, uh, the computer knows what sort of directions to take for that to happen. Uh, you check for user input, input, that really important part of that loop that I was talking about earlier. You check for whatever the user wants to do. That could be pressing a, a button on their controller. That could be um, blowing into a microphone. That could be stepping on a potentiometer. That could be all kinds of different things. Um, and you get to decide that, so neato. Uh, and then you want to check for if the player's won, if it's like if they've solved a puzzle, if they've gotten to a specific point. You check to see if they've won or lost the game. Not all games have win or lose states, but a lot of them do. Uh, and then you draw everything to the screen. So like I could have done all that stuff and then forgot to draw things onto the screen and then I try, try and test out my game and it's just a blank screen and I'm just like, what's going on? And it might be doing all that stuff, but if it doesn't draw to the screen, then the player doesn't get that feedback. So we're going to make Mario real quick. We're going to do the create function. We're going to initialize the game. See the score up there? 
it's not a, some things aren't really that visible, okay? So cut me some slack. Uh, we're gonna load in a level. So I've loaded in this level, and now we're gonna load in some objects. So now the game's ready to play. This is Google Slides, so you don't get to play it. But I'm gonna go through what happens on the update function. Uh, I'm gonna apply gravity to some objects to make sure that they fall down. Um, that's just updating their velocities. Uh, I'm gonna check to see if they're colliding with things. In this case, these guys are colliding with the floor, so even though they're being pushed down, they don't get pushed down into the floor, they collide into, and then they get pushed back out of the floor. Um, we're gonna check the AI. So for this AI, it's pretty easy. It's just applying a velocity to the bad guy, that goomber, uh, and it's just gonna move that way. Then I might check for user input. In this case, pressing right on the controller is gonna apply some force to Mario down there to move him right. And that's about it. You do other stuff like check to see if he's colliding with power-ups. Um, you might load in power-ups into specific objects in the creation. Um, you've got the flag at the end where if you get to that point, it checks to see how high you are up on the flag and gives you points accordingly. So Mario is a pretty pretty simple game. It's not, not really, it's really crazy complicated. But here's a little bit more of a simple game. This is uh, some kind of weird thing that your grandparents know about <laughs> called Pong or something. Um, but in this, you have a spaceship and you got aliens and the aliens are invading. Uh, uh, presumably? <laughs> I don't think there's any cutscenes, uh, so I have no idea what's happening, really. Maybe you're invading space. Did you ever think of that? Flip the script. Um, so, if I was making this game, I would, you know, initialize the score. I would initialize how many lives a player has. I would plop down uh, where all these aliens are. I might have different formations of them for different levels. Um, I give, I put the player down. Uh, can anybody maybe raise their hand and tell me my, what might be happening in the update function? A uh, couple things. Um, basically, they'd be moving from left to right, the aliens, I mean, and every time mm -hmm. they reach a certain point in the XY axis, they go down a notch. Yep. And it's also checking to see whether or not you're pressing left, right, or shoot. Yep, so it's updating the AI, and the AI in this is really dumb. It's just move left and then move right, go down, move left, go down, move right, go down. Um, and then he said checking for user input, whether you're pressing right, left or right. Um, additionally, the fire button. Um, it checks to see whether the bullets you fire are colliding with any of the aliens. And if they are, you kill an alien. I don't know if they have health or what. I've never played this game because I'm a young buck. <laughs> but anyway, so, so you can see already you can kind of, uh, let's say this game didn't exist and you were sitting around thinking like, man, I really wish, I want to bang up some aliens. Uh, okay, so maybe I want a spaceship, I got a gun. And now you can sort of intuit what you need to write in the code to make all of your dreams of uh, alien murder true. Um, and then the fun part is playing it over and over to test and see if it worked. Sometimes it doesn't work and it's a bummer. Sometimes it works beautifully and you're like, I'm a flipping genius. Uh, and that's sort of magical. Um, and then maybe you forget about what, what maybe I want to have some stuff for the aliens to destroy too. Uh, to make it a little bit tougher or something, or maybe to use as shields. Ooh, pretty cool, right? So I don't know. Can you sir, can you can you win space invaders with all your little bases destroyed? It's not like missile commander rules, right? But wouldn't it be cool if you if that was part of it? Because that would ha that would sort of serve two purposes. You want to you want to defend your bases but also you can use your bases for cover. That's some emergent gameplay right there. Um, anyway, that's just part of the fun of making games, is like going through it, figuring out what's fun, finding that, sort of messing around with it. Um, 
Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of programming. This is something that you can go to computer science school for thousands of dollars. I've already saved you thousands of dollars on music school. Now I'm going to save you more. Variables uh, are, it's a word for things that can change, right? That's what that means in math and stuff. Um, here, they're just uh, things in your program that store information. So you can see up there var, and not all the time you use var. This is just a, one way of doing it. But var, which means variable, my number equals 16. So you can tell that's a number. Uh, my boolean equals true. Boolean is a super silly word that means true or false. Um, it also kind of means one or zero, which is kind of crazy too. That number could be all kinds of things, total, a bunch of numbers. Trust me, there's a lot of numbers that could be. Boolean can only be true or false. Um, my string says hello. You see how that's in single quotes? It could be in double quotes too. I don't want to tell you how to make your strings. Um, but that's just a string of letter, or letters that make whatever you want. It could be a word, it could be a sentence, it could be a super secret passcode. Uh, in this case, it says hello. Um, so a string, that's what a string is. Uh, my array, an array is an array of things. It could be an array of numbers, like in this case, it says one, two, three, four. It could just as well say 23, 512, 62, zero. It could also be thousands of numbers or like millions of numbers, or it could be one number. It could be empty. It just have those brackets up against each other. Arrays are really cool. Uh, or you could make an object, and an object is like a thing that has other things in it. So in this case, it has a number and a Boolean. Um, these are not the complete palette of things to use in programming, but this gives you a good idea. And you can make games with these. Blocks. This is the next stepping stone in understanding how to program anything you want ever. You see these funny squiggly lines? This one opens it and this one closes it. That means this is a block of code. And in some programming languages, you don't even need curly things. You just push it around. But in this one, this made up one that's a lot like the one I like, uh, it's just these squiggly lines. And I indent the things so that I can visually see oh, that, all that stuff that's over here. That's part of this block. Um, blocks are really cool because it lets you sort of organize your code into meaningful things. So um, <clears throat> what that sort of leads to is um, visibility. And what I mean by that is that things inside a block can see things that are outside a block, but things outside a block can't see in the block unless you tell it to in special ways. So for instance, this variable here, you could, you could use it in this block, but this variable here, if you tried to figure out what that variable is down here, it wouldn't know because it's in a block. It's tucked away. Um, and that's really important because when you have these blocks of code, you can say, okay, this block of code tells my character to jump. If I go in and fiddle with stuff in that block, I don't have to worry about it affecting stuff outside of that block. So, yes. Yeah, variables want to go inside, not out. Thank you. If else, um, this is something that is very intuitive. Um, if I press the jump button, I want to jump. So we have this guy here that says, if, if something is true, I'm going to do a thing. And then we have this else thing, this like dark, evil cousin of if. <laughs> It's not really. It just says, if, if that's not true, this Boolean, if this Boolean isn't true, Boolean, silly word, true or false, I'm going to do something else. So if something's true, do this thing. If it's not true, we're going to use this else shortcut. We could say, if something, do, do a thing. And then we could say, if not something, do something else. That's another way of doing this. But we use if else because we're smarty pants. 
The next thing, now this is advanced, this is what basically scientists are just figuring out now in computer science. Uh, these are loops. And loops are really important because you, computers are dumb and we want them to do things over and over and over that we don't want to do themselves. I didn't know about this when I first started making games. So when I made a game in which you shot a dude across a, a giant circus tent, I had this circuit, circus tent graphic that I put here. And I said, OK, so, so when, I'm going to put that one here. Then I'm going to put one here. And then I'm going to come over here and put one here. And then I'm going to come over here. I'm going to put one here. And you can go really far. So I put a lot. Um, but a loop lets you say, hey, do this thing over and over. Just do it like 70 times. Do it like 128 times. Um, so this loop here is a for loop. And what that a for loop does is you determine some rules. Uh, in some languages, it's a lot more explicit. And this language, it's kind of shorthand. But I'm going to say for, and then I'm going to say this variable i. I use i a lot, even though it doesn't really mean anything. And I just told you to write stuff so that you can understand it and have meaning to it. But I'm a liar, and I do these things that I feel bad about. I'm, I just is short for iterator. This is an iterator. And that, that i, when I make it, is going to be 0. And then I want to do this loop over and over until that i is 16. So every time this loop happens, i is going to go up 1. So trace in this programming language means spit out this thing in the console. So I'm going to say trace i. So the first time it runs, it's going to say 0. And then since it's a for loop, it's going to run 16 times. It's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then when it checks, it says, OK, I is 16 now, so I'm not going to do it. Um, the next one is a while loop. A while loop is a lot like a for loop, but it's a little bit different. It's a little bit dangerous, you know. Uh, you can trick your computer into doing a while loop forever, and then your computer gets real sad and real hot and real loud. <laughs> but this one, you see, it's kind of doing the exact same thing. It's saying, oh, I'm going to make this I. Again, I'm, I apologize for being a dirty liar. Uh, and then I'm going to say, while I is less than 16, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trace that I. And then at the end of that, I'm going to put I up one. Um, so that's going to do the same thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then when it's 15, it gets here and it says, OK, I'm going to make i uh, one more. And then it goes back and it says, is i less than 16? No, it is 16. So guess what? We're done with our loop. If we took this out, it would just trace it and get back to the beginning and be like, oh, i is still 0, so I'm just going to do it. And then it does it like millions and millions and good trillions of times. Um, so does that sort of make sense to you? Yeah. Yes. It's saying, it's saying just do this block. You see these squiggles? Do this block while this is true. Um, so for example, that could be used um, to put a lot of different things in a lot of different places. You see that I getting bigger? I could say, put this thing here. The next loop, i is one more. So I'm going to say, put this thing here, but plus this amount, plus i amount. So it's going to go further. So that way, I don't even have to do crazy math, y'all. So the thing I think a lot of people get frustrated with programming is syntax and all these different crazy rules that the computer has that you don't even know about because you're a human. Um, and one of those things is like syntax and like, do, I don't know where to put all these weird symbols. What do I do? Um, so like here there's a bunch of errors in this code and my code won't run. But I want to tell you right now, squash that anxiety because most of the time the computer's smart enough now to say like, oh, that's, that's where you messed up. I don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Sometimes it tells you exactly what to do. But it'll just be like, I don't know what you're supposed to be doing, but this ain't right. Um, 
So you see, like, just by looking at it, oh, maybe I should put a comma there instead of this guy. What, what's wrong with this position? It's supposed to be referencing this position. Oh, I see, it's uh, uppercase right here. Oh, yeah, same deal with these guys. And um, over here we have these blocks, and it's saying that this is wrong, but I know that's part of that block. But, oh, yeah, I see, this, this block here, this never gets closed out, so it thinks that there should be another one of these guys. So you just sort of, you can lean a lot on the computer just telling you what to do. And then you just fix it and everything works and everything's wonderful. Um, so that's like a huge thing that like, you'll learn a syntax of a programming language just by using it. And if you're really anxious and have like a fear that you just don't know what it is, just go ahead and try it and let the computer tell you what to do, the compiler. The compiler is what takes your semi-readable code and translate it into completely illegible nonsense that computers understand. Yeah? I'm a computer science student and my professor, one of the first things I learned is that my professor told me, um, Google's your friend. Yeah, Google, you, you just Google everything. There, there are legit so many people that are getting paid like insane money to write programming and, and most of their days just like, oh, let's see what Google says because I don't really know. Yeah, Stack Overflow is really awesome. That's a website where people are like, I don't know what this means. And then everybody says like, you're an idiot because it means this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to the guy that originally said it that wasn't me because now I feel smart. Um, so yeah, if you're afraid of programming, just do some programming. Um, you can screw things up doesn't matter. You can, you know, go into the Doom source code and change, like, the copyright id software to say, like, uh, uh, my farts smell great. And then you know how to program. Um, don't, be, don't be afraid of screwing up because everybody that programs screws up. In the same way that everybody that makes music, when they're tapping out a melody on a piano, they'll hit a wrong note. It sounds dumb. That doesn't mean they're an idiot. It just means that they have to fix it or everybody will think they're an idiot. So now we're going to move on to design. This is sort of new in this talk. I did it a little bit last year. Um, I don't think a lot of people talk about this because for some reason a lot of people just think that video games are just art, code, and music. But uh, if you're making a game, you have some sort of intent for that game, whether it's just to be fun, whether it's to communicate about bird migration, whether it's to teach people how transit systems work, you have some sort of goal for the game. And if it's just being fun, then that's totally fine. Um, so like, what's Mario about? Uh, I think like a precursory look at Mario would be like, oh, it's about this like weirdly small but then big plumber dude who has to save a princess from this dinosaur guy. Um, so yeah, it's a classic, you know, the princess got stolen by a monster story um, and then you have to fight him to win the princess. But what I want to say is Mario is not a really about that. Mario is about running and jumping. That's what, that's what Mario is, is running and jumping. And because Mario is about running and jumping, you get all kinds of cool stuff. You get avoiding enemies, you get jumping over platforms, you get timing things, you get collecting coins, collecting power-ups, collecting score, collecting princesses. And then all that leads to this cool story that comes out of it, which is you're Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of saying like, oh, I want to make a game, about like this motorcycle dude that has to go uh, murder this other motorcycle dude because the drugs were wrong, <laughs> which could be a cool game. Maybe say like, well, what are some things that I can explore in this game? Like maybe I want to explore uh, 
the way it feels to fall in an elevator or something. So yeah, I'm gonna do falling and like gravity or something. Um, there's all kinds of cool things that you could just get from verbs, you know? So here's a bunch of verbs that are in a bunch of video games. Like most video games have a lot of these verbs in them. Um, and it's fun to just take some of those verbs and explore them. So the point is finding, is taking some of those ideas and then experimenting with them. You can iterate over this game hundreds of times. You know, you start off, you get the, you get the pong dot on the screen, you get the pong dot going between the paddles, you get the score going up. But then you can say like, what's the most fun part of this? Is it like, you know, the, the, the magazine says Pong is fun, but like as a designer, what's the fun part? The fun part's like trying to hit the ball in a way that the other player loses. So maybe I'm gonna add more mechanics around that. Like maybe I'll add some sort of fun way to give spin to the ball that wasn't there before. Or maybe I'll figure out a way to like block the other player from moving. Um, so the idea is to find the fun or whatever you want to communicate. It could be frustration. It could be uh, the joy of discovery. It could be uh, the, the, the fear of being alone. There's all kinds of things that you can do with just mechanics. And so like I was saying before, when I was younger, I had like all these ideas about games and they were things like, you know, maybe I have this thing where the player kind of goes into this like state where he can um, like uh, perfectly execute a level and he just practices it over and over and then when he comes out he can go do that and he's like this scientist guy and then all the other guys are like these futuristic cop dudes and then there's like graffiti and the graffiti allows you to do these like weird things where like the graffiti is like digital graffiti because future and like it also does stuff like tells you where enemies are and that's why the thing can work when you go into this mode because your brain knows where the things are and it can think but like really that just gets broken down to like what if i had infinite chances to do something until i actually had to do it that's the mechanic so you have like these ideas for games and they're not bad ideas, they're just dumb ideas. <laughs> Where you just have all these crazy things that you, like a bucket list of different things that you want in your game. But like maybe all of this could just be, uh, I just wanna explore jumping and shooting and falling and like that's what I wanna do. And all my friends here know that I'm talking about the game of the year. Down well, the game about going down a well. And so like what's cool about this is it's about jumping, and it's about shooting, and it's about falling. But all of those things, when you explore the game, and I, I'm not entirely sure how the process was, but I imagine, you know, he started off pretty simple when developing this, like, you know, I've got this guy, he can shoot when he jumps. Uh, well, you know what, that kind of leads to some interesting stuff, because jumping, like Mario, you can jump on some enemies and hurt them. Some enemies you can't. And so they all sort of come together in a really interesting way where the falling in the game isn't just an action you do. It progresses the game. It progresses the, the, the thrill of jumping on things when you're going really fast. It, it, it's how you jump down the level. To, and it's how you reload your guns, which feeds into the shooting mechanic, which is really cool because it's how you kind of clear out obstacles. Um, so yeah, the point I'm making is that this game has a very limited amount of verbs in it, but they do a lot of stuff together and it results in a game that's super fun to play and it's super engaging. So there's not a lot I could say to like start off, like I've, I've tried some different things to sort of foster that idea. I had like this dumb card game where you could place down verbs in specific orders that you sort of make up to say like this verb affects this verb and will lead to this verb. And that's a kind of fun exercise but I think the best way that you can go about teaching yourself the way the, these mechanics can like relate to each other is just make games a lot. Make a lot of games, make tiny games, make one game over and over 
it's just the best way to learn. Um, so, yeah. Good luck making games. Uh, enjoy making games. That's what I really want you to do, is not to stress out about making games. I stress out a lot about making games. But it's great to be in a headspace where this is for fun. Um, I'm doing this as uh, a way to enrich my life and to make something special. Here's all those lessons. Um, all these lessons apply to every aspect of games. So even though I said experiment often when talking about music and audio, you should experiment often when making, when writing code. Uh, there's tons of different things uh, that you can do with programming. There's a tons of different methods. There's a ton of different ways to approach programming games. You should try them out. Um, keep it simple, super simple. That applies a lot to programming for me, personally. Um, some people get really complicated in programming, and sometimes that can be really uh, frustrating when you're trying to look up, like, how do I make this box move? And somebody has, like, 500 lines of, like, this is the perfect way to make a box move. <laughs> like, really, you can make a box move in a couple lines of code. So uh, keep it simple. You can always do it later. You can do, you can add juice to code. You can iterate over things to make it more complicated. But keep it simple. You'll thank me later. Um, doing fixes fearing for everything. Uh, if you're afraid of making art, know that th th that anxiety comes from you not being at a level that you want to be at. Or maybe you don't have the tools that you think you need. But if you just make some art, uh, you kind of get into a space where, OK, so this isn't about like making the perfect uh, anime husband. Oh, It's more about uh, expressing myself. And that's actually very fun, even though I'm not as good as I wish I was. So yeah, that's all the information you need to get in touch with me. Um, if you have any questions about making games, feel free to uh, reach out to me that those ways, um, and otherwise, do we have time for a question or two? I'm sorry, no. No time for questions. Um, I'll be out in the hallway if you want to ask any questions. <laughs>